started here. We're just a couple minutes behind schedule, but we have a full agenda here for our fall ETV workshop, Electronic Theses and Dissertation Workshop. Um, very happy that you could all attend on this fabulous fall day. Uh, my name is Mary Roach, and I'm an associate dean in the libraries here. And um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this event, which is co-sponsored with the Graduate Studies Office. Um, and uh, we have a number of people that will be participating, uh, presenting in this uh, workshop today. Um, we have uh, Mary Ann Reed back there, our Digital Initiatives Coordinator from our Digital Initiatives and Discovery Services um, Division. Um, Amber Roberts up front from Graduate Studies, it's Policy Coordinator. Uh, Scott McKeithran hanging in the door there. Um, and Pam Brooks usually uh, helps present. Um, she's not able to be here today. And Paul Thomas up front. Um, Scott and, and Paul are from the Center for Graduate Initiatives and Engagement here in the libraries. And um, we have Paul Johnson over there. I think he'll say some words about another word processing um, software tool that he's quite fond of. And so they'll all uh, have a part in, in this presentation here. So um, I think we'll, we'll get going here. We've been offering these workshops um, for quite some time now, both in the fall and the spring. So you're welcome to come back. Um, another time if, if you're um, just now getting ready to think about your dissertation or if you're getting ready to sub submit in December, then this is probably really um, informative for you. We hope so. Um, anybody here graduating in December? Okay. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, if, if you are graduating later on, you'll find this information useful, and you're also, also welcome to come back to um, future workshops. Um, so, uh, Mary Ann will cover the scholarly publishing access, uh, ownership, copyright, embargoes. Um, Amber will cover uh, procedures in graduate studies, graduate schools, college, general procedures and the path towards graduation. Um, the Paul Thomas will cover formatting of your thesis and dissertation, uh, PDF conversion, and I will actually go through the submission process itself, so you can uh, watch, watch me do that. Um, the workshop is scheduled for an hour and a half. I know you're all busy. We hope you can stay for that. If you can't, we understand that you might have other activities you have to um, be at. Um, we'll have time for questions at the end, but you're certainly welcome to also raise your hand and ask a question at, at the moment, particularly if um, you have to leave early. So I think everybody got the handouts, and uh, we'll get started. So Mary Ann. Hello. I don't know if we need a mic. What do you think? Do we need a mic? Oh, something's on here. Uh, may I boom? Uh, Megan is going to be recording the session uh, so that we can share it with people who couldn't come. I hope that's okay. Uh, if you need to ask something privately later, just I've got cards and you can contact us and we can help you later if you need that uh, and feel shy about speaking up. We wanted you to think about copyright issues now. How many of you are at the zombie stage, right? You're just about done. Yes, exactly. Amber's about done too. You're just about done and everything is kind of overwhelming, right? So you are very wise because you are here to think about this now, right before you get to the zombie stage. Because um, there's maybe things that you need to do or that you wish to do uh, to make sure that you're complying with copyright. Now, why you should care, besides the fact that it's good scholarly practice, right? Um, you should care because the ETD release form that you have to sign in order to graduate, has anybody seen this form yet? It's one of the forms on the grad study site. Um, but you have to sign it in order to graduate. It has these, this section about copyright. And there are three choices here. Um, you could choose all of them that you, that you that apply to your situation. 
uh, what sometimes happens is that the document doesn't contain any copyrighted materials that belong to anybody else. It's unlikely, but it does happen. Um, the other thing is that you're using things, but you've determined that it's a fair use. And if you've done that, then you keep a fair use checklist on file that's recommended. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit more later or privately after the, after the workshop. Or the third thing is you have copyrighted material that's used with the owner's permission. Often you'll have a, an email from them saying it's okay to use it, or you'll have a formal form. It kind of depends on, on what you're doing. But if you have the permission to use something that you're using and you have documentation of it, they ask that you provide that documentation of those permissions. So if you have questions about copyright, there are people here in the library who can help you. And what you should do is contact the Schulenberger Office of Scholarly Communication and Copyright, that's a very long phrase for people that are really, really, really able to help you, okay? And the easiest way to contact us is to send a message to copyright at ku.edu. Or you can contact me, you can contact my colleague Josh Bullock, who's in the back there, Josh, wait. Josh in the back. Um, we'd be happy to help you get through this last piece. That's part of what we want you to get out of this, is that there are people here in the libraries and at graduate studies who can help you. So let's go on to the next thing. We have some great resources. For those of you who like to look, on, look at stuff at 3 in the morning, you know, and want to look at stuff on your own, um, the Copyright Resources Live Guide is really, really helpful to most people. And we also have a copyright decision tree that takes you from the very first question is, is this thing that I'm wanting to use copyrighted? And all the way through, well, what if I try to get permission and I can't, what do I do? So it's a great step-by-step -step guide to what to do to make sure that you're complying with copyright law. Um, and that's, you have a handout for that. It's www.copyright.pu.edu, and it, that's written on the handout. That copyright resources guide is updated periodically, so the tabs that you see will change and be added to as we get more information for you all. Uh, KU Med Center, anybody here from the Med Center? They have a nice website there for copyright compliance. Um, the third resource is one that's really, really nice. Uh, KB Cruz, Kenny Cruz is a very prominent um, copyright expert. He used to be working with the university. He is now in private practice, but he's done, he's a big copyright expert. And so what happens is he wrote this for ProQuest. This ProQuest is the place you're submitting your thesis or dissertation, right? Uh, he wrote this for ProQuest, and it's on ProQuest's site. Um, I think you might find it very useful, because he talks about things in a way that is very understandable and very um, savvy. It's really smart. Okay. Now, the thing is, is that as a person who's creating a thesis or a dissertation, you actually work with copyright in two different ways, right? Because you are using other people's copyrighted materials, usually. But you are also a copyright holder, right? The minute your thesis or dissertation is fixed in a tangible format, you own the copyright for it. You do not have to register that with the Copyright Office. You have it automatically, according to US copyright law right now. If you do register your work, and you can do that if you wish to, um, either online at the Copyright Office or through ProQuest, if you want to do it during submission, it's kind of easy. Um, if you register your work, it allows you to seek certain kinds of damages if people infringe on your copyrights. Um, it's up, totally up to you whether you do this. It's just something that we wanted to make sure people understood. If you don't register and you want to sue someone because they've used your work, you can register it right before you go forward with that. But the problem is, is that there are certain kinds of damages you cannot get if you don't register it sooner. Any questions? Okay. All right, so enough about copyright. Um, if you have more copyright questions, we'd be happy to help to send a message to that copyright account. We submit things at KU electronically. Have you all realized that, that you, there's a little link on the Grad Studies website that you're going to submit your thesis or dissertation to? And part of the reason that we do it electronically is so that we can make it available in two places. 
your thesis or dissertation will be made available in uh, ProQuest di Dissertations and Theses database. Okay? That's an online database. Many, many libraries subscribe to it. So you'll find that in a lot of places. But it is something that libraries have to pay for. So not every place you go will necessarily have it. The other place that things will be made available when you go through the submission process is KU ScholarWorks. That is KU's online institutional repository. It's absolutely free. It's open to the entire world. Anybody with an internet connection can see your work. That gives you incredible visibility. And we have people that make it their job to make sure that KU ScholarWorks is very, very, very visible. And it is. One of the things you may not realize, does anybody have supplemental data or audio files, video files, things like that? Yeah? Um, you can upload those things as well. It's a, there's a separate little thing on the web page that Mary will show you um, that you can upload as separate files unless you want to have it included in your dissertation and kind of depends on the format, how that works. But uh, supplemental data and media are perfectly okay and able to be uploaded. So here's the thing that's nice. You know, it's going to go to two places, but you only have to submit it once. All you have to do is go through your ProQuest submission tool. It's reviewed by your college or your school, depending on who you are and where you're from. It then goes into a holding pattern until you graduate. So those of you who are graduating in December, if you submitted today and you got through everything and the, your local administrator said everything was cool, it still would not be in ScholarWorks until after you graduate. And even then, it's 12, up to 12 weeks of processing. So it stays in ProQuest, in the ProQuest submission tool, until you graduate, and then your administrator goes in and says, go. And then it goes to ProQuest for processing. So three months, sometimes less, sometimes more. If you're looking for your thesis or dissertation in ScholarWorks and it's not there, contact us, please. Because sometimes what happens is paperwork can get a little mixed up. We just, there's all sorts of things that can happen. And we will investigate and figure out where your, where your process is so that you can get your thing visible and available. But it's simultaneously putting put it in both of those two places, the University of Kansas copy and ScholarWorks and the Trump Anybody have any questions about that? Okay, so we talked about this a little bit already. KU's copy is made available through KU ScholarWorks. It's totally open access. That means anybody can get to it. You don't have to pay anything to have that happen. And this is an important thing to realize because ProQuest would like to charge you $95 to make their copy open. You don't have to do that. ScholarWorks will, will make it open for you. So you can save yourself that $95 and just make sure that you, uh, when you put it in, that we'll put it in ScholarWorks and it'll be open for the world to see. And it'll be very visible because sometimes Google searches will put things from institutional repositories on that first page, usually at the top. So that means it's going to be very, very visible. You have to, in order to have this made available in ScholarWorks, submit this ATD release form. But you're going to do that anyway because it's a requirement of graduation. All right, so, whoops, sorry about that. So while you are submitting, and when Mary's demonstrating this, watch for this particular screen because it asks you to select the type of publishing that you're going to use. Unless you really, really want to spend 95 bucks, which most of us don't usually have, um, choose traditional publishing. That's the one that's going to be made available in ScholarWorks. You do not have to choose the open access publishing in order for ScholarWorks, the ScholarWorks copy to be available. We try very hard to make sure that there's no extra cost for you to make your work available and visible because students here are doing great work and we want to make it sure that people can see it. Now, there are reasons sometimes for people to not want their thesis or dissertation to be made visible right away. And I don't know, does anybody have a feeling as to whether they would need to do that or not? Are you in the sciences? Humanities, okay. 
Humanities scholars often um, have to think about this a little bit harder because sometimes it can be an issue and sometimes not. Uh, creative writers, anybody cre creative writing? Yes. Creative writers, uh, there are some special options for you. We can talk about that after the thing. But there's a lot of reasons why someone might choose this. Um, you may have a patent. Anybody here working on patents? We often have scientists that'll have a patent too, which is really kind of cool. Uh, sometimes the data is sensitive. Sometimes you're getting ready to publish it, and you don't want to make it available before that. Um, sometimes the research is restricted, and there's rules that you can't make it available. You would normally know whether the, any of these things apply, and if you don't, then you should talk to your advisor and your committee and see, make sure that they're in on this decision, because they have to sign. Uh, somebody from your graduate your graduate program has to sign to say yes, and embargo is okay if you decide to choose that. So I always recommend talking to your committee, talking to your advisor, and make sure if it makes sense or not. Because sometimes you need to realize that the visibility as a young scholar can be a lot more important than the embargo. So it's just something to think about. There are several embargo options. You can choose six months, one year, or two years. And they are infinitely renewable. So there is a lovely form on the Graduate Studies website. It's very easy. You just go to the ETD website there and fill it in, and boom, they, Amber will process it and send it to us, and your embargo will be extended if you need that. Most people don't, though. They let it go, they have their embargo, and then it goes open after that stuff. I think the form is like three fields. It's like your name and your title. Or it is it's the, really easy. It is the easiest KU form you will ever, <laughs> ever, ever fill out. I don't think they even have to sign in first. I think they just uh, type no. their emails and things like that. So yep. it's very great. It's another form, but it's really easy. The only thing I would suggest is if you think you're going to have to renew, write on the calendar when you're going to do it because you need to make sure you do it before the thing is released to the open because when something's out in the open, it's very hard to pull it back. And I might just add to this uh, topic that the embargo starts the month you graduate and extends for six months, two months, a year, and then it's renewed on that same cycle. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Uh, like we just visited to the student and professor. You know, I'm not sure. I, I can't hear you. I'm so sorry. Can you speak up? Okay. okay. If the immortal is uh, kept in a place, so it has been applied, so the work who is it available to the student, advisor, and department? No, no. If there is an embargo in place, it's not available. The metadata, your title information, author information, abstract is available to the public through KU ScholarWorks, but the work itself is is not viewable by anybody. Occasionally we'll be contacted by a student that says, um, can I have a copy of my thesis or dissertation? In which case, if we know it's you, we can share it with you. But generally, it's not available for anyone. All right, yeah, Amber. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this embargo, the, the embargo renewal form is only for the ScholarWorks embargo, right? Correct, so very good. Other yes. embargo with ProQuest, they have to do something. Yes. So, and you know, we should probably say something about that on the embargo renewal page, too. That just occurred to me. That would be a smart place to put it. I think I updated it. I think there is something there. I'll check. Okay, so do you realize that that embargo renewal process is just for the ScholarWorks copy? If you want to continue the embargo for the ProQuest copy, you have to contact ProQuest. And there's a handout about the differences between the two in the back. Mm -hmm. And I believe. I handed out to everyone that was already sitting in the room, so everybody should have it. I think um, there, there's a crucial difference between those two that's worth pointing out, I think, which is that if you don't renew your embargo in the ScholarWorks, the KU thing is going to become available to everyone in the world with an internet connection. If you don't renew it in ProQuest, it will only be available to the people who have access to subscri that subscription database. So it won't be on the open web, it will just be available. Unless someone downloads it and puts it on the open Well, that's true. Which can happen from ProQuest. Yeah. But Josh is absolutely That would be right. a copyright and license violation. Exactly. But that's possible. But Josh is absolutely right that um, ProQuest is a licensed subscription database, and it may be OK that you want to have it be available through that. But it's also very widely licensed. A lot of people subscribe to it. 
So um, you're, you're cutting it down, the axis down a little bit, but not a whole lot. All right, um, so the ETD release form does the embargo for the ScholarWorks copy. Request it before you graduate, because remember, after you graduate, it goes to ProQuest and it's in processing. It's sometimes hard to catch it when it's in the middle. So please request it before you graduate, and you can renew it, and there is the lovely link that Amber created for you, which is, again, one of the best, easiest forms to fill out. You have to get the approval and signature of the director for grad studies in your department. That's on the form. Um, and if you want any more information, there's an embargo policy, and that's in the policy library at KU. So if you have any questions about that, we can help you out later. So here's what happens when you're in ProQuest. Okay, so choosing the ETD release form, that's where you, you select the, the ScholarWorks embargo. Here's where you select the ProQuest embargo. So while you're submitting, you see two options. One is I want my work to be available as soon as it's published. That's what most people choose. But if you decide you need to embargo, that's when you say no. Do you realize that you have to do that in order to get the ProQuest copy embargoed? And then there's a um, the choice, the same the same choice: six months, one year, two years. And if you want to renew, if you want to renew it, you contact ProQuest. Does that make sense? There's two two different processes there. And now I'd like to turn over the podium to Amber Roberts Graham, who is from Graduate Studies. She's going to talk to you about deadlines and things you need to do before you graduate. Good morning. Um, also, I guess before I get started, there is a calendar in the back with all of the various graduation requirements and deadlines. We try to, to sync up with um, you know, the registrar's academic calendar and stuff like that. Um, so the, the university graduate deadlines are all on the calendar. We also always advise that you check with your school and make sure that if they've got any extra uh, requirements or deadlines for you, um, that you know about those. So this is, this is just sort of an overview of the process of what's going to happen once you think you're ready to actually do this. Um, one of the most important things that you need to do, you can't graduate unless you tell KU you're trying to graduate. And the way that you do that is you file the application for graduation. Um, it's in your enroll and pay account. So you just log in to your, your enroll and pay. Um, you'll click on graduation, and then you'll click on KU apply for graduation, and it'll lead you through a series of steps. Um, effectively, you can do that pretty much at any point once that application is open. They're, I believe, open right now for both fall and spring, possibly even summer 2017. So if you think you're going to graduate in any particular semester, you can apply for that now or as soon as you're ready. Um, if, you, if you jump the gun a little bit and you apply now and, and you think it's going to be December, but it actually is going to be more like February, um, it's it's no problem. You're much safer applying now and then going in and saying, whoops, never mind, I rescind, than you are waiting too long and missing some of these priority deadlines that we're going to talk about. So um, I, w I would say as soon as you think you might be ready, go ahead and, and file the application. There's no, there's no penalty for rescinding it. Uh, you can just do it again the next semester. Um, you want to, of course, plan for your defense. So you work with your committee. Um, you get everything scheduled. You make sure that you're meeting, you know, sort of advance notice deadlines for filing that paperwork and getting rooms scheduled and that kind of thing. Um, you'll defend. One of the things you need to make sure you do in your defense is you have to take your title page and your take your acceptance page anyway, just in case. The title page for sure has to be signed by all of your committee at the time of the defense to certify that it was a successful defense. And you do have to turn in a hard copy of that signed page. Um, your acceptance page is a little bit similar. They might accept the finished document without revisions at the time of your defense. So you can take it with you and get your chair's signature on that one. Um, they might say that you need to fix your footnotes or something like that. And so then you would you would get your acceptance page signed once your, once your document is finally approved for submission. Um, the, the, the paperwork that I mentioned, um, I've listed here some of the, the, the basic things that we require all of the schools to collect, but some schools, like the college, has a few extra things that they'll also ask you to submit. Um, so there, there's essentially a small packet of hard copy paperwork that you have to turn in. Um, 
sort of, you, you submit your, your dissertation electronically, but you also have to turn in this hard copy paperwork. And that gets, um, it, it's important to be clear about what goes where because we can't have, we can't have the, the signatures from your, from your committee on the title page that gets submitted electronically because then it's going to go in these open databases and anybody could like, copy their signature and take it. So you want to make sure you have a, a blank copy of the title page and acceptance page in the electronic document and then you, you put the, the hard copy wet signatures with your, with your packet to your schools. Um, your packet will also include the ETD release form that we just talked about and then also uh, proof that you completed the, the exit surveys, the doctoral completion survey and the survey of earned doctorates. Um, there's a certificate or a printout or something at the end you turn in to show that you, you did that. Um, you submit your document electronically when you're ready. You can do that from anywhere. Um, and then, of course, you what you're all waiting for, you want to participate in, in some one of the recognition ceremonies. If you're a master's student, you need to contact your school and figure out which ceremony that they're offering for that. Um, if you're a doctoral student, Graduate Studies runs the doctoral bidding ceremony once a year. Um, that's in May this year. It is Saturday, May 13th at the Lead Center at 7.30 p.m. Um, a couple of things that I'm, we're just trying to get the word out as, as widely as we can right now, share it with all your friends. It is a ticketed event, so you do have to register. We are not able to accommodate people who miss the registration deadline. Um, the registration deadline is that you have to file your application for graduation no later than March 1st. So if you think you might want to walk in the May ceremony, either because you're a, a spring graduate or a summer graduate, go ahead and file your application for graduation for either semester by March 1st. And like I said, if it doesn't happen, you can rescind it if you need to. There's no penalty, but that way you know you're going to get in to the ceremony and you know you're going to get your tickets for your guests. Questions on that? <clears throat> if you're a December graduate or if you're a summer 2016 graduate, we'll send you emails and stuff because we already know about you. But if you're, if you're thinking around May or summer, make sure you, you get that in on time. Okay. This is um, the administrative timeline of sort of what goes on on our end once you submit your electronic thesis or dissertation. You will go in, you'll, you'll send us your PDF, you'll think it, you, know, you, you do all your formatting, you, you get it the way you want it. Um, it will come to me and then I will send it to the, um, the school level administrator. So, you know, in the College Office of Graduate Affairs or in your school, um, I'll send it to a particular person who's responsible for confirming that you do actually turn in your, your packet, you meet your graduation requirements for your degree, that your formatting, you know, meets our basic standards, that kind of thing. Once they've, they've sort of checked your comprehensive picture and make sure you're ready to graduate, they'll go ahead and accept that. And then after graduation, after the degree is conferred, December 31st for uh, fall or May 15th for spring, then they will go ahead and, and sort of take all of the ones that they've accepted over the semester and they'll, they'll push them forward and they'll say, now it is actually done. They'll send it to ProQuest. They'll do all of those kinds of things. about specifically what's involved with each of the pieces of the, of the hard copy packet. Um, these links here um, we have in other various handouts on the back and we also have on the Graduate Studies website so there's, there's ways for you to get um, that information. We do publish uh, formatting requirements, so the, the sort of university standard for what it's supposed to look like is published on our website. You, you are welcome to read that. If you open that document, there are um, examples at the back that show you what's required and then highlights in red what's you know to be modified for your project, uh, your name, your title, that kind of thing. Um, so you can find those on our website. Um, there are templates, editable templates for you to use with uh, Microsoft Word that are available um, through the libraries. And there are guides for how to use those on, you know, on the ETD Lab Guide site. And then um, Professor Johnson maintains a KU uh, thesis template in LaTeX that's also editable, so you can 
if you're using LaTeX, you can use that template. It meets all of our standards already. Um, and that, uh, the, there's a link to the, to the package on our site as well. You will need the ETD release form, which is on the Grad Studies website under, under electronic thesis and dissertation. There's a button, and you'll find the, find the release form there. Um, and then we also have links to the required surveys, doctoral completion surveys. Obviously, if you're not a doctoral student you're just, and you're finishing a master's, you don't have to do the doctoral completion, but the rest of it still applies to you. Okay. Hi, my name is Paul Thomas. I'm with the uh, Center for Graduate Initiatives and Engagement, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about some formatting tips for your dissertation and theses. Uh, ProQuest is really particular about the way you set up your dissertation or your thesis. Um, luckily for you, on the Graduate Studies website, we have several PDFs with uh, the explicit requirements, as well as sample documents and templates. And if you are a LaTeX user, uh, we also have a template that has all of the requirements and, um, already adjusted, so you don't have to worry about that, uh, you lucky ducks. Um, so now, first thing we're going to talk about is the page formatting. Uh, the margins on all sides need to be one inch, um, and you can't go smaller than that. And your pages also uh, cannot be landscaped. They need to be portrait. Um, so if you have material in your dissertation or your thesis that uh, is landscape, you have to rotate that or use like the snipping tool to take a picture and then uh, manually rotate that in Microsoft Word. And finally, you can have no blank pages whatsoever in a dissertation or a thesis. Um, and that, so that includes near the beginning or near the end. They need to have text on them or they need to be um, in terms of page numbers, the title page counts as page one, but you do not put that number on the title page. It's going to be blank. And so the, the page after the title page is where the numbering is going to start, and it's going to start with the lowercase Roman numeral two. The preliminary pages uh, for a dissertation or a thesis are going to be in Roman numerals. Um, it's only after the table of contents that you start using um, Arabic num numbers, uh, starting with one, of course. Um, and we have a, uh, library guides. Um, yes, right here. Uh, if you go to guides.live.ku.edu/etd, we have uh, guidelines for each and every section of a dissertation or a thesis. So if you have a question about a particular area um, and you you know you you don't want to necessarily come in or email, which you always can. Um, you can go here and click on a specific section that is giving you uh, trouble. So we have, you know, title pages, font, page numbering, etc. So this is a wonderful research that I urge you to use. Yes? Paul, are you still offering those wonderful ETD formatting workshops? We are. are. What's the next one? Is it November? I believe it's November 9th. November 9th. Yeah, and if you are cu curious and you want more <laughs> in-depth detail about uh, formatting, we have ETD workshops. I guess the next one is going to be November 9th. Um, and if you come to those, uh, we will dive in and, and really explore all these areas in uh, detail so that you can really perfect your thesis or your dissertation. All right, let's go back to this. Whoops. I messed it up. OK. Um, and then another thing to uh, be careful of is if you are using uh, older versions of Microsoft Word, some of them do not automatically embed the font. Uh, font needs to be embedded if you're converting it to a PDF. Um, if you're using Word 2011 or uh, for the Mac or Word 2016 for both the Mac and the PC, uh, the fonts will automatically be, be embedded. But if you're using a different version, you'll have to do it by hand, and I'll show you how to do that in just a second. Okay, another big thing that's uh, good to learn how to do is to create an automatic table of contents. Luckily, you can do this with Microsoft Word. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to go into your thesis or your dissertation, and you're going to go to the heading that you need to format. So, for instance, in this image, uh, the heading here is chapter one, and it's formatted in flush left, bold, times zero, mid 12. Let's say that's the style that you want your chapter headings to be. What you're going to do is you're going to highlight that, and then you're going to go up here 
to the style gallery, and one of these says heading one, you're going to right click on that. And then there is an option that says update heading one to match selection. If you click on that, that will link the style here to the heading here. So every time you need to format another chapter, you can just click heading one and it will format it with you know Times New Roman 12 bold flush left or whatever it is that you need. Um, and you can do this for chapter headings, subsection headings, etc. Um, so that's extremely important to use. And then when you need to create a table of contents, uh, if you go to the area, the preliminary page where the table of contents is supposed to be, if you click and then in Microsoft Word 2013 and 2016, if you click References and Insert Table of Contents, it will automatically create a table of contents. You have several different styles that you can pick. Um, in uh, Word 2011 for Mac, it's under Insert, Index Table of Contents, and then Table of Contents. Um, and so in the Show Levels box, you can choose how many levels you want to go down. So sometimes you, you might just want you know, chapters. Other times you might want individual subsections. Sometimes you might want to go all the way down to you know, uh, tertiary subsections. Um, and then you can click OK. Um, and then so if you ever make a change to the table of contents uh, in regards to a chapter itself, like you change the title or you put it on a different page, it's important that you need to, uh, to update the changes on the table of contents. And you can do that by clicking on References and then Update Table. And Again, Microsoft Word 2011, uh, if you click Document Elements and then Update, it will do it. And I mean, I guess you could do it all by hand, but who has time for that? So. <laughs> all right, and then the last thing is embedding fonts in Microsoft Word. Uh, this is for Word 2010 and 2013. If you go to File, Options, Save, uh, down at the bottom, you'll have these options here. Um, embed fonts in the file, you want to click that, you want to unclick, do not embed common systems font. And then you'll click OK. And then that will embed it. Like I said, if you're using the newest version of Word 2016, you don't have to worry about that. It will automatically embed the fonts. All right. And then this is, um, because of Johnson, this is your time. Yeah. Uh, the I cringe when I watch word users because I hate the feature that you can change the document style by interacting with your content. So for me, the style should be a set thing that you integrate with your application, your program, your project, and you can't accidentally damage the style by right-clicking in the wrong spot. So uh, I, I'm not here to say that you shouldn't use Word if you like it. That's that's uh, good. Many more dissertations have been done with, with Word than anything else. Right. But I quit using it about 20 years ago because I was fed up with uh, accidental changes throughout the document cost by cutting and pasting one paragraph on, on line 42 of the 18th page. So I became fed up with it and I looked around for more structured way to prepare documents and uh, LaTeX turns out to be the answer. LaTeX is more like writing a program which makes it difficult and useless to many people who are not programmers by nature. But there's a free program called Lyx, L-Y-X, that's a graphical interface that you can use to prepare documents in LaTeX and generate PDF, and it works more or less dependably in the, in the same way that, uh, that I expect, which is that the style structure is specified separately from the document, and if you want to change the way the document looks, headers, table of contents, and so forth, you edit the style rather than uh, fiddling in, in the document itself. So we have a fledgling page about this here. This points at the um, uh, zip file that's the thesis template. And it's uh, actually a small chunk of dissertation that we prepared with some chapters that shows you how these pieces can fit together. Uh, it's prepared with Likes 2.1, but there's also a version. You From Likes, you're editing in a, like a thing that looks like a word processor, and you save it. And then you can export it to LaTeX code, so that if you, if you happen to be in engineering or a hard science, and you like to actually write in LaTeX, you can write directly on the tech file. But I'm, a, I'm a, uh, using the more pointy-clicky editor lately because it's more fun. But um, the, uh, 
things more or less work go through just well. We did have a dust up in May about the problem that font, a font embedding is inconsistent. And I expect this will come up in Word as well if you use it, so I might as well mention it. In your document itself, it's easy to guarantee the fonts are embedded. It's automatic in LaTeX. Right? But if your document imports uh, graphics from, say, R or MATLAB or other places, if those are inserted into your document, they don't come with embedded fonts. They don't get the, They don't pick up the embedded fonts by manufacturing the document itself. So wherever you manufacture your uh, inserts, you have to make sure those other programs are embedding the fonts. And by default, R does not embed fonts. So you you have to make sure that those things are put in by MATLAB or any other program you use. But we got to the bottom of that in May. It was like a fire alarm going off because one student's dissertation didn't pass muster with the inspector. So we we. Uh, we are uh, dedicated to try to make these things work within our capabilities. Now, if you, if you take the template and then you decide that you want to change the styling in some significant way, and then you come back and tell me, oh, it doesn't compile anymore, all I can say is, well, if you change things that don't compile, then I can't, I, I don't, I'm not a full-time programmer. I don't know necessarily how to fix every conceivable problem that a person might cause by trying to insert unexpected style elements. Uh, the last time this came up, it was uh, someone who wanted to put article abstracts at the beginning of every chapter. And books don't have abstract <coughs> things at the beginning of every chapter. And so when they did that, it made the style break in a way that was very hard to understand. The error messages were completely unhelpful. So uh, we do eventually get to the bottom of these things, but it's not always going to end up with uh, it's usually going to migrate back, back to what we say is the standard document rather than fixing the, the document style to match your special view of what things ought to be. But I think it's fun to use LaTeX and uh, it's integrated well if you want to uh, write how-to guides, for example, for R users or other things because you can embed the R code in the document which will then be processed and put into it automatically. So uh, we are having a workshop on Saturday afternoon where we'll give an overview of what, what Likes is all about. And uh, the, 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 best, the most traffic we get on the handouts we have about this is called How to Cheat on Your LaTeX Homework with Likes. <laughs> so um, we'll march through that. And then we have uh, about an hour's worth of examples of the dissertation template. If they have just a quick question, can they contact you guys? Yes. And from 1 to 5 on Monday through Thursday, we have the open consulting time. And many of the GRAs in the randomly, randomly chosen days, many of them will be able to look at your project and, and, and notice what's wrong. If they don't know, then we'll, they'll ask another one or they'll ask me. So um, we try our best to be helpful. We, we don't have infinite resources for this, but we can, if you try to compile the document we give you and it fails, we definitely have a duty to fix that. And we definitely, I think, have a duty to, if you want to make changes like write in a different, um, put elements in in a different language, that's a, a difficult thing because integrating different character sets can sometimes cause errors. But things like that, we, we know how to fix them in special cases and we're glad to help. Thank you. Paul, do you want to tell them where you're located? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our office is right across the hall in the Center for Research Methods and Data Analysis. And uh, we're open 9 to 5, basically Monday through Thursday. Friday is meeting and workshop day. And if you'd like to be um, on our announcement email list at serumdata.k.edu, they're on the main page. There's a link to sign up. So when there's a workshop coming up, it's a good way to see what's available. Thank you. All right. Um, going back to the requirements for a dissertation and theses, this is the order that you need to have your final uh, copy in. The title page first, um, 
you don't want to have the signatures of your chair or your committee members. That's for that's for a different thing. Acceptance page, same thing, no signatures. Abstract, acknowledgments, that's entirely optional, it's up to you. A lot of people include it, but it's not necessary. Table of contents, and then the content of your dissertation or your thesis, your reference, and then your appendices. And then you have to submit this through the ProQuest, ProQuest website. Okay, uh, we've covered a, a lot here so far, but this, so I want to pause and just see if there's any questions before we actually, before I move into the actual submission process. You might have questions after I, yes, Paul. So um, when when somebody submits a dissertation, is is there somebody who, well, my dissertation got rejected because on page 169 I had some subscripts that were uh, off of the line by too much and the person said, oh, these don't meet the standard. Mm -hmm. So it, is there somebody who takes the documents that you get and, and gives them the going over with the fine tooth comb to say, oh, that character's too small, all that kind of stuff? In each school, the college, um, there is an administrator that is assigned, and that administrator's, um, if you don't know who your administrator is in your school or, or college, um, there's a handout, it's blue, that's got all the names on it's also on the website those individuals are responsible for um, opening up reviewing the file um, ch checking for margins uh, landscape that's not uh, oriented right um, those kinds of things now I'm not sure how you know how much time any given administrator might spend on this. Um, some may be more thorough than others, but I do know that people get um, emails back. The students, you get an email, email back from your administrator saying, this item needs minor revisions. They don't go for major revisions because that's content and that's your committee chairs and um, members of your committee that would talk about major revisions. They will be looking for things like margins that aren't right, uh, images that that are askew, um, you know, things like things like that. So, yes. So I did a master's a couple years ago, and um, I submitted it to ProQuest, and then uh, three months later, I get like, oh, you need to change this. As <laughs> <laughs> a matter of fact, I didn't even see it, so because I sent I sent an older email that I didn't have, and I didn't see that. But five months later. I guess I just kind of gave up. Did, did you get that email from ProQuest or did you get it from somebody? Uh, it's else? been so long now I can't oh. remember the, because uh, ProQuest, the details of how this was. Because I had a couple of yeah. uh, issues that I resolved and yeah. then finally good to go and, and silence on your end for the longest time and then out of the blue the sucker came in. Yeah. And then, uh, but they couldn't find me and eventually they decided to publish it anyhow. Yeah, that's, um, that can be a problem. That's why it's, it's good for you to submit your document, your thesis or dissertation, as early as possible, um, assuming it's been approved by your committee, um, even though it doesn't get sent off to ProQuest until after the graduation date. Your administrator will be looking at that hopefully, before that graduation date so that he or she could send you information about revisions that are, are needed um, and, and so that. But here, but here I'm, with, I'm in the physics department and I'm seeing uh, what the administrator is in this blue sheet right here. Uh-huh. Uh, is Swartz, Swartz Lane. So she's going to be looking at my document well, in yes. detail. Yes. I think and everybody know. else that comes out her yes. the college, which is fairly large. Yes. I, don't, there, I have a hard time believing she's gonna. She does. She's gonna catch everything. She compares. She's been doing it for a lot of years, so she knows the standards and stuff. But essentially, what the school level administrators are looking for is compliance with the requirements document that's posted on grad studies. So it's the basics. It's margins that are required for you know printing in book format. Um, you know font size. <coughs> 
type, you know, spacing, double space, those kinds of things. The, the basic requirements that the university says you have to, to accomplish, she's checking. Anything else stylistically, um, you know, she's probably not going to go through with a fine tooth comb and catch every instance where there's one, one space or two after a period. Those kinds of things are, you know, more stylistic and left up to the user. But uh, she is checking for compliance with the university standard. Okay, well, um, if you have questions while I'm going through this, um, feel free to um, go ahead and ask. But um, if you're just starting off from the KU website, the easiest, quickest way on the main homepage uh, is to type ETD in the search box, and that will get you to the graduate studies um, page where you can get the link to submit to ProQuest. So um, before I actually Start the submission pro process. I just want to mention, and this isn't usually a problem, but if you have huge, a huge file, which is over a thousand um, megs, um, you cannot submit it electronically. You have to burn it to a DVD and send it in. And there's a charge for sending in things that um, um, manually instead of electronically. Yes. That's a question here. So if you have graphics. Uh, you know, PDF or JPEG, because JPEG is very small compared to J PDF. Is there an issue with some, if there's with the college about, well, JPEG doesn't have enough resolution or, or whatever, um, or publication or what? There's, um, or does it all have to be EPS or whatever? There's um, recommendations on, on compression, the size for compressing you know, images. Um, I think it's 600 dpi is the um, recommended um, compression for that. Um, mostly, I, I don't think we've, I don't think we've had an issue. Um, that's a lot. Of, that's a huge document. But if if you are finding yourself close to that limit, you might want to contact um, the libraries, and there may be ways that we can help you compress some of the files or or they could be organized slightly different into some supplementary files. Um, but um, do you think you might have an issue there? Not sure. Okay. Well, well PDF is the gold standard for graphics. But Microsoft Word doesn't make it very easy to use PDF graphics. They want you to have PNG or something like that, as you mentioned. And it's a, it's a problem because you see a lot of bad looking graphs and these things. But I think there's nothing to do. No, no way to avoid it. Yeah. Some PDF graphics can be capture a lot of data in there. And it can be very good. Yeah. So um, we're going to. Oops. Come up, Marianne. I'm on the. The, uh, the thing that'll work? Yeah. The link? Yeah. Well, goodness. Well, it did yeah, not work. Um, PNG, I think, is uh, not glossy. Right? If you cycle a JPEG through and edit it, the quality will deteriorate. So that's what they want to use PNG instead. Is it, it's, uh, it doesn't degrade. So if you could make PDF work, it would be nice. The, the first thing that you'll need to do. Um, if you haven't already done this, and you can do this at any time, you don't have to um, wait until you're actually going to submit your your actual uh, approved um, document. But you can go ahead and set up an account ahead of time. I recommend that you do that. Include your email and your uh, address and um, basic information. So then, when you're ready to to submit, you can come back to your um, account and just actually finish finish off the submission process. So um, you do need to set that account up. So I'm going to log in. I'm going to log in as an administrator, and then I'll switch back to student here. The other thing too is if you contact us in a few months after you graduate saying, you know, where's my work in ScholarWorks, we can also check here to see if it's still in the administrator for whatever reason. Okay, I've got 
lot of things from all of our practice sessions that are in the queue here, but let's ignore that. But um, you must meet your graduation deadlines for submission. I, what did you say was the de December de deadline? The, the application for graduation? Mm -hmm. Or um, the submission? Mm -hmm. Was it the? I think it's the 16th, but let me check. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it is. It's 16th. So yeah. you have to submit your dissertation by that time. It doesn't mean that there might not be revisions needed on it, but if there are, as long as you've submitted it by that date, you're good. The submission, the, the revisions can be done, minor revisions can take place after that. So I am going to start a new submission here. So this will be your um, view when you first start. You see off to the left here, there's instructions. You can just, you'll be working down this, this uh, left bar here, and you can stop and start at whatever point the, the, I'm right now into the instructions page here. What you want to make sure is you have your approved copy of your PDF, you have a copy of the abstract, and you have any supplementary files already um, ready to go. You know your advisor and committee members' names <laughs> spelled correctly. They really <laughs> appreciate that. Those names go into the metadata, which goes out to the world, so they really appreciate it if you spell their names correctly. Um, there's also the need to identify and your own name and your own title. Well, that's true, too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, double check. Double, double check. You'd be surprised how many times there's slight problems with the title in particular. Um, you will also need to identify um, a, several broad subject categories that ProQuest asks for you. Um, and they give you the, the subject category list, the real broad, but you'll be able to add some other keywords. But you take a look at that beforehand so you know which subjects, uh, broad subjects you want. There are no fees to submit unless it's manually submitted. Um, there is a fee for the copyright, as we mentioned earlier, it's $55 if you let ProQuest register copyright on your behalf. It's a convenient way to do it. Um, you don't have to do that. But, um, so, we're going to get rolling here. So now I finished the first step, you read the instructions, and we're into the publishing options, as Marianne uh, pointed out earlier, traditional publishing, open access. Um, again, we recommend that you uh, check the traditional publishing. Um, this one requires a $95 fee. Um, if you do want to um, have them file for copyright or you want to order print copies, make sure you have a credit card in handy because they will be asking for that credit card towards the end here. So I want ProQuest to publish my work as soon as possible. Yes or no, and no is when it drops down and opens up these other options uh, for the embargoes. These embargoes here must match the embargo terms that are on the ETB release form um, if you're going to choose an embargo. And again, if you renew it in two years, you need to come back to ProQuest um, to renew that if you want it renewed through ProQuest. Fill out the online form. Um, if you want it renewed um, through KS Rollbook. So, and, and here's some of the options that they'll, again, that they cover for, um, for reasons that might be an embargo. But I'm going to say yes because um, I want it out there quickly. Because you're looking for a job and people are wanting to see what your work looks like. Exactly. <laughs> and you can just point them to the the link that once it gets posted. So, because you can't say if it what if it doesn't show up in in KU Scholar Works, you can't point your employer to the thesis and dissertation database or ProQuest because they don't pay that high fee to allow um, that allows them to to look at that database. So, so here's 
uh, the traditional publishing agreement that you must click through here in order to move on in the process and it essentially um, lets ProQuest, tells, ProQuest tells you that um, they have non-exclusive rights um, to post your, post your work in their website um, and so forth. Talks about copyright and traditional publishing and royalties. It is possible to get royalties from ProQuest if they sell your work, but it has to has to be um, um, accrued at least to 25 US dollars, and you have to leave them with your address and email and all that. Um, but your work will also be available openly through KU Scholar Work, so um, the likelihood of um, people um, of getting royalties are probably slim. So I'm, I'm going to accept. So here's where you would have, when you created your account, you would have filled out uh, this basic information, um, which I did earlier. Um, I to tell them that my permanent address is the same as my current. I'm going to save and continue. So we're down to um, what we call the metadata that your author information will come over. You don't see that here. It comes over from your account. So again, that's where you want to spell your name correctly. Um, you put the, uh, put the title of your dissertation as it's presented in, in your um, PDF copy here. It should be identical. Um, we recommend that you use upper and lower case with proper um, uh, capitalization, proper nouns, proper adjectives. Some people find it easier to, because they um, aren't sure what should be capitalized, that they'll capitalize the whole title. You can do that, it's just a little harder for people to read something that's all in caps. So um, the recommendation is for upper and lower case. But, um, I'm just going to make a buff. Title. Um, and the year that your manuscript was completed, which may be different than the year that you actually graduate. So you could finish in, in 2016, but you don't actually graduate if your manuscript was completed in 2016, but you don't graduate until um, 2017, so you have the option um, of selecting the appropriate dates. But I'm going to graduate in December. And then the degree that's awarded. These are the degrees that are, are specific to the University of Kansas. So your degree, if you think you've got a different degree, um, you should double check with your school because these are the official degrees that are offered. Um, we just added Doctor of Nursing Practice for the Med Center. So. And the department. So I will And this is where you include your chair and um, committee members. Usually, which I think most most of the time, just one chair as opposed to um, co-chairs. But the committee members then um, go here. Okay, so you can have quite a few committee members again. These are on your title page. Your committee members are typed out on your title page. They're not, they don't sign anything that's, that's um, included in the, your PDF upload. They, your, your PDF should have the date you graduated, the date the degree was awarded, and the date on the acceptance page. Those, those things should be dated. Um, I oftentimes see that 
people forget to put the dates there. So, so here's the primary subject category. Um, this is the list that you would have looked at ahead of time. Um, so you can see that. Really broad history. And, um, you can select additional subject categories up to three, and then um, whatever keywords you want to make it much more explicit. In here, you pop, copy, copy and paste um, abst your abstract. Your abstract can be any length, um, but in any printed indexes that uh, ProQuest produces, they will truncate. They won't. They'll just stop it at um, 300 words for a doctoral dissertation, 150 for a master's thesis. You don't really have to worry about that so much. It's just that that's what happens. Uh, um, if your dissertation or thesis is not in English, they ask you to make also include an English translation as an abstract. You can have your, um, the original language of the text plus an English translation. Also, if you include supplementary materials, you'd want to mention those supplementary materials in the abstract. Do we have people in here in the uh, in hard science fields with a lot of formula? Formulae? Yeah. Are you going to want formulae in your abstract? Mm -hmm. Are you going to want to actually have a formula that's crucial to your argument in your abstract? Oh, uh, oh, boy, that. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's pretty straightforward, filling out that, that metadata that we just went through. Um, then you're to the point of uploading your file here. And you would have that either on a flash drive or on your, on your laptop, wherever you're working. So click Upload, and Marianne has some PDFs on her. It's on the desktop. Yeah. Yes, it is my desktop. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so I'm loading the file. That's a really quick, easy way to um, attach the file here. Um, okay, so we'll cover the supplementary materials in just a minute, but. Um, do you have copyright permissions to submit? So if you have copyrighted material and received permissions to use copyrighted material, you want to, you know, you want to say yes and then upload those files here so that if ProQuest looks at your data and questions whether you have copyrighted materials and don't see these files, then they will be contacting you because they will not publish something they they believe um, where you may have used copyrighted material without permission. So, so I'm going to say no, I don't have any. I'm going to save and continue. So we're to the point of supplementary files. If you have an audio file, an Excel spreadsheet, um, a movie file, um, those can all be loaded here. Um, you do the same thing, upload a file. Um, let's find out a different kind of file here. So an Excel file. So those two things are have now been added to this um, submission. A PDF and an Excel sp spreadsheet. They ask that you um, Describe it here, whatever it is, and you can upload it, an additional one. If your entire dissertation or thesis is, is in a non-print format, it can be um, submitted, but you still have to include a PDF of your title, your acceptance pages, and abstract. They would be very small, um, and then you attach your your electronic file as a supplement. 
So save and continue. So if you want to make any special notes to the administrator that you may have never seen that is out there um, looking or will be reviewing your um, PDF, um, you can send, make a note here. Yes. One of the notes that I see most frequently there is if your email address is going to be different after you leave KU, sometimes it can be helpful to say, you know, you can reach me here, and then that way if they have questions about your submission, that kind of thing. Okay, so moving on, we're almost done here. So here's where you have the opportunity to register your work or have your regi work registered by ProQuest with the Office of Copyright. Um, and they ask you whether there was um, copyrighted material was previously filed for this or not. Um, and I'm not going, I, if you want your, if you intend on registering your copyright, this is the most convenient way to do it. Um, I'm not going to do it here because I'm not going to give them my credit card, five dollars here. So I'm going to say no here, but um, you know, again, this is a convenient way to get it registered without the hassle of going to the copyright site and saving 20 bucks. There is a question. Yes. Um, if you embargo your dissertation because you intend to publish it um, with another publisher, it wouldn't make sense to file for copyright at this point, right? Because you'll do it when the new version that you publish with another publisher? Well, they're two different, they would likely be two different editions. Okay. Um, and you might want to, I mean, you still hold the copyright on your dissertation, regardless of whether you register it. It's just, um, they're two. They, they would be two different, most likely, unless it was a short story that um, that is identical to. Yeah, they would be two different versions. Yeah. yeah. So you're saying it would still be worth considering mm -hmm. registering. Yeah. yeah. So you, after you um, finish the registration part, you have the opportunity for ProQuest to uh, to order print copies. Um, Hardcover bound copies or soft cover copies from ProQuest. Um, sometimes you, people still like to get them to family members, sometimes to their chair or print copy. Just want to say that there's probably cheaper places to do it than here, and, and we have out on the Graduate Studies website uh, several um, publishers that the library has used and can recommend. Um, once you get your final version, you could ship, uh, load it up to their their site and it's, it's probably cheaper. The other thing to remember is if you're an international student and leaving the country and it takes um, 12 weeks before ProQuest would publish it and then you've left the country and how do you get your print um, version, um, it's a little more problematic so you might want to, to actually go with a different um, publisher for your hard copy or soft bound version but some people choose to do it here. Again, it's convenient. So I'm just, again, I don't want to give them any money, so I'm doing, going to decline to order here. <coughs> so this is a summary then of, of um, the details of the information that you um, filled out earlier. You can um, change it go, at this point, go back and change things. I'm just going to go ahead and hit submit here. And you, as soon as you hit submit, you, or shortly thereafter, you will get an email message um, saying that your dissertation thesis has been submitted. It goes on to, the, to Amber, who will then forward it the email information that she gets. Um, regarding the submission. As you get a submission, Amber would also get a submission. Um, she's going to forward it on to the administrator in your school or college, and then that person would be communicating with you in email after they review it, saying, you know, it needs minor revisions, or 
I she may he or she may say it's past my review and that still sits in the queue until the graduation date before she actually ships it off to ProPress. But you, you would know um, before that time that, hopefully, um, that it actually passed, passed the review. So, so I am done here. And that review is what, three months, you said? Well, so there are kind of two, there are two phases. And I, I actually wonder if you didn't get an error message from ProQuest once it actually arrived with them. Because what we're doing at that stage is, is evaluating the ETD is part of evaluating that you've met your graduation requirements. And so in addition to taking all your classes and doing all of that, they're checking your, your thesis. Um, we do our level best to make sure that our formatting requirements are consistent with what ProQuest requires. But there is a possibility that they check it, it meets our standards, and then for whatever reason ProQuest says it doesn't meet theirs, and that's where that three month difference might come in. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know what happened before. Um, well, and, and, and occasionally there's changes in administrators, so something could get hung, it, it, there could be a problem on this end where it got hung up between one person leaving and another person coming on board. And we try to map, remap those, but sometimes. Well, what are we, um, how do you get the, the, from your administration that you're good to go or, or just you're published? Or, or? You, should get a, you should get an email from yeah. your um, administrator there. And if you don't, you can send, send the individual a, a, an email saying, I haven't, I haven't seen anything, but if you sub if you submit, say in January, you I know some of you are December grads here, but l let's just say you're graduating in May and you you submit your dissertation, which has been approved, and you submit it in December. The administrator might not review that until April. Hopefully, they would review it sooner so they don't all pile up at the end. Depends on the unit and how many graduates there are, but um, as, as soon as um, the administrator approves that, even though they don't forward it off to ProQuest, you will get a message confirming that everything is great, good to go. But if you have any questions, you should reach out to the administrator on that contact list. And, you know, technically speaking, you could take it into them in advance in, in hard copy or on your laptop or something and, and get their sort of tentative, yeah, this looks okay. Other, other questions? Has this been helpful? Yeah. If you think it's been helpful or in it, if you think there's things that you didn't learn that you would have liked to have learned, we encourage you to fill out the yellow form there, the evaluation form that helps us and improve our workshops and please let other people know that we do 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 these there'll be another one in the spring and then you're welcome to come back um, you're welcome we encourage you to you know contact the libraries We're, we have lots of people that will help you with the submission process help you with the formatting um, help you with copyright issues so um, please feel free to reach out to us we're here to help so thank you for coming and if you have other questions you want to hang around and ask specifically, feel free to do